Good morning, and welcome to the Terry Leadership Speaker Series. My name is Maddie Jewell, and I am a senior Leonard Leadership Scholar studying management information systems and business management. We are thrilled to have you here today to listen and learn from our guest, Ken Kendrick. Mr. Kendrick graduated from West Virginia University with a bachelor's degree in business administration. After graduating from WVU, Mr. Kendrick started his career with IBM in Baltimore, Maryland, then founded Datatel Incorporation. He went on to serve in various roles within the banking industry before pursuing his next venture, his longtime passion, baseball. Mr. Kendrick has been involved with the Arizona Diamondbacks since 1995. In 2004, he assumed the role of managing general partner of the team and has led it to capture the National League West division twice since. Mr. Kendrick is committed to his fans and to the financial stability of the organization, having eliminated more than $200 million of debt during his tenure. He also serves as the chairman of the Arizona Diamondbacks Foundation, which has raised over $50 million alongside the DBACS organization since its establishment. Throughout his 12 seasons serving as managing general partner, Mr. Kendrick has turned the Arizona Diamondbacks into a model organization in Major League Baseball. Mr. Kendrick is involved in a wide variety of philanthropies, including the Bumblebee Ranch, the Barrow Neurological Institute, and the Cleveland Clinic Institute. He has received a number of awards, including the Visionary Award from the Foundation for Blind Children, the Spirit of the, of the Children Award from Child Help USA, and Man of the Year from March of Dimes. He also serves on boards for various charities throughout the country. Mr. Kendrick is dedicated to his wife, Randy, and their two children, Cal and Katie, who support him in his desire to serve others constantly and his commitment to leading the Arizona Diamondbacks. So please help me in welcoming him to the Terry Leadership Speaker Series, Ken Kendrick. Thank you, Maddie. My name is Justin Lovsky. I'm a senior Leonard Leadership Scholar studying finance. Mr. Kendrick, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're all excited to have you here. Well, I'm, I'm delighted and I'm amazed at the uh, turnout on a bad weather day. And uh, although I, I'm told by President Moorhead that uh, I'm uh, responsible for you all getting out of class early today. So <laughs> that's my gift to all of you. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks again for making the trip. Um, I'd just like to start out by asking some questions about baseball and leadership and the relationship between the two. And then at the end, we'll open it up for some questions from the audience. So you've held many roles during your career, and you continue to hold many different types of responsibilities. How have you tailored your leadership style to fit those different roles? Well, you, you do need to t uh, be different in different settings. Uh, baseball is the most unusual of the settings because it's, it's a combination of business and entertainment. And, and so, uh, the approach you, you take there is some different than to go back from my early days when, uh, when I was an entrepreneur and founded a, an early technology company, uh, the style that, the style that you, you would adopt in, in that kind of setting and the approach that you would take to, to run a small company is a very much more hands-on approach to leadership than in an organization the size of the Diamondbacks and especially an organization in sports the thing that you, you, you learn quickly once you're inside of, of sports is even though you thought you knew a lot about the sport, even though you were always a fan and you went to all the games and you thought you understood it, you really don't. And you have to learn that in terms of how you operate and how you lead, you, you really have to lead through others. You have to pick the very best people you can find. You have to give them a lot of freedom and, and you, you have to trust what they do. Your, your job is still to evaluate how they do their jobs, and if uh, they're not successful, then you, then you make change. So on the one hand, a small business that I first started at, it's a very hands-on and direct leadership style in, a, in an organization like a baseball team. Uh, it's, a, it's a more uh, engaged, but uh, not direct hands-on in many of the activities. So you mentioned that baseball as, as a business is a bit different um, than, than maybe the regular business world. What was one surprise you learned about baseball kind of as you were transitioning into your current role? Well, the biggest surprise of all was, you know, if I go back, um, I'm a little over 70 years old, and, and I've, I've been a baseball fan since I can remember, and it was what 
baseball was one of the great bonds that I had with my dad, and I imagine there are others in the audience who could say the same with their parent, uh, that it was a, a, an experience of sharing things with, with your, uh, uh, you know, with your parent. And you went, I went to a lot of games. Uh, in, the, in the old days, uh, I would listen to games on the radio, they would have game of the week on TV, and ultimately th uh, things have evolved to a way different uh, setting. But I felt, honestly, and I don't mean this in, a, in an arrogant way, I thought when I got involved in baseball, I really knew a lot about it. And it was very quick that I learned that I knew almost nothing. And that was the biggest surprise to me on being a baseball insider, that I just wasn't near as knowledgeable about the game and the nuances of, uh, of the things that go on with the players. And I'm talking about the on the field part of the game because there's a business element. And I was, you know, and was and am comfortable with the business side, the baseball side itself. Uh, I've, I've learned that I have to be very cautious about advancing my opinions uh, since I am the owner, I am the boss, you know, my, my opinions might be followed and at times it's not in the team's interest that we do what I think we should do. That's a very, uh, was surprising and it was a hard lesson. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that uh, a lot of the learning you had to do had to deal with some of the on the field stuff um, and today we were talking yesterday about kind of how technology and data has really changed uh, the landscape of the game. Um, but does that uh, emotional component or the relationship with the players and the chemistry, does that play into any of your, of your decisions as a leader? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, all of us in our sport, and I, I think it's true, uh, true across the other sports today, we're trying to get that perfect balance of using data and technology as against instinct and personal judgment on evaluating players that we might be drafting. You know, we would look at uh, the amateur draft and look at players from Georgia and other schools and, and evaluating them. We would have scouts review their performance, but we would also have a lot of data on their performance. And, and there's an a, a analytical component to that. You don't want to get caught all, up, uh, all caught up in the numbers, but you don't want to dismiss the numbers. So that striking that perfect balance is what I think all of us in sports are trying to do. Some teams weigh more heavily on the analytical side, some way more heavily on the uh, scouting and personal observation side, and I think those that do it the best, uh, you know, blend uh, blend all of that together. And in fact, it, it, what's happening in sports today, and uh, uh, there are probably many in the audience who know this, there are tremendous opportunities uh, for careers uh, in major league sports uh, for people with uh, MIS and statistical and finance and other backgrounds who, who can take data, correlate data, use data to help make good baseball decisions. So I would, uh, I would encourage some of you who might have interest in, in a career in the business side of sports who have those kinds of skill sets or those kinds of interests to think of baseball as a possible career. Absolutely. So since you've been in baseball, have there any, been any other owners that you've leaned on for advice or yeah. have any of them served as mentors for you? Well. I, ha I have the good fortune to live in Arizona, and, and in Arizona, we have uh, half of the clubs do their spring training, and several of the other team's owners live there or have, have winter homes uh, in, in Arizona. And so through that, uh, them being in our community, uh, you have a chance to maybe spend more time with some of your fellow owners uh, than you would with others. And, and one in particular, in fact, uh, I've just come from baseball meetings down in Florida, uh, uh, earlier in the week, and uh, one of my favorite uh, people in all of sports is the owner of uh, the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bulls, uh, Jerry Reinsdorf, a very well-known, famous guy in sports, uh, owner of the team during the Michael Jordan era. So he probably, among owners in sports, has the most rings, if you will. Uh, we all would respect and admire somebody who has all those rings. And he's a very, uh, Jerry is, uh, he is my senior in age, he's my senior in experience, and certainly in knowledge. And so he's someone I, 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 I uh, respect. He's, uh, I've been known to, to be a pretty direct and, and blunt personality, and he makes me look like a sweetheart. And 
So I, I admire that. Let's say he's the, if, if I could use it, uh, phrase it this way, he's the later, later stage George Steinbrenner. And I have a feeling that's a name many of you know. But Jerry is somebody I look up to. And then second, uh, someone who was a team owner, but I got to know uh, as, as our boss, as our commissioner was Bud Seeley. And Bud had a, a, you know, one of the longest tenures ever. Within a year of serving uh, the longest term as baseball commissioner, he retired just one year ago, uh, 22 years as commissioner. He has uh, a winter home in, in, in Arizona, uh, spends a lot of, uh, uh, now even more time. And uh, he had been a team owner in a smaller market. Arizona is a smaller market, so there were common threads of, of things that are a part of ownership in a market like Phoenix uh, versus a market like New York in terms of how you have to operate, how you have to plan uh, and build, build your franchise. And so Bud had that personal history, but he, he then you know, was the commissioner during the time that I knew him or have known him. And you know, he, he is one of those people who, uh, even though a very busy man, uh, and in a very important job for many years, he always had time. And uh, he, he, he was most helpful and, and continues to be, is now Commissioner Emeritus is his current title. And so I, I, uh, I look up to him. Uh, I see him as a mentor also. Great. So you mentioned you just had uh, some owners meetings down in, down in Florida. Um, what, what do those meetings kind of look like? Can you walk us through kind of what it looks like when you have a bunch of baseball owners sitting around the same table? Well, <laughs> it's that uh, being in sports and being in sports ownership is a, it's for some of the young men and, and young ladies who are in fraternities and sororities, uh, it's a little bit like being in, a, I mean, I was in a fraternity as a college kid, and so it's the most similar experience that, that I've had in my business life, uh, being a part of an owner's group, and, and it's, it's like going to a frat meeting. Uh, we probably don't have as much fun as I remember having when I was a college kid, but let's say uh, a good part of our meeting time is given to things outside of the meetings. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we enjoy being with one another. We learn from one another. We, we, have, fun, uh, we have fun with one another. Uh, you know, we have serious matters that we deal with. I mean, one of the, one of the meeting uh, 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 sessions this, this time was... Uh, we had the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Johnson, came and spoke to our group. And, and all of us, and uh, it, it certainly occurs here on, on campus, uh, we all have great concerns for our responsibilities with our fans, in our case, in your football games and other sports. You have large numbers of people gathered. It's a perfect opportunity for someone who wants to uh, act out some act of evilness uh, to do so. And so we're very concerned with and, and very attentive to security. And so we had the Homeland Security people there. We had meetings about, about ballpark security. It, it's, I hate to use this as, a, as a, a comparison, but it's a little bit like the balance, balancing act. Security is like the balancing act of uh, analytics versus uh, uh, scouting and blending them together. Uh, it, it, it's the protecting people against uh, against uh, an evildoer, but at the same time not totally undermining the experience of being in an event that you're there to enjoy. And it's, it's very challenging. And as life moves forward and our world becomes a more threatening world, those kinds of uh, circumstances are things that we deal with more than we ever did. An example we're uh, talking about, we, we play a lot of games. And uh, you know, baseball plays 160 games. So we have 80 games at home. So our fans that are really devoted to us attend a lot of games. If you're a football fan, you may attend eight games. If you're a baseball fan and totally devoted, you'll attend 80. You're willing to put up with things eight, time, with things eight times a year that you might not be willing to put up with 80 times a year. So yet we have to protect uh, the, the, the fan. And, and that's a, uh, it, it's a challenging part of, uh, you know, one of the things that maybe you wouldn't even when you think about sports, that isn't necessarily as a fan, you don't think about that part of it. But you, if you're on our side of the, of, of the uh, bar, you, you, you have to think about uh, you know, the security of the people who come to watch your team. So uh, uh, that was one part of our meeting. But 
Uh, we're right now, and some of you in the room probably uh, uh, are, are aware, we're gearing up in baseball for the once every five year event uh, of a labor negotiation. And we have one of the most unusual labor negotiations ever in the history of man in that the, if I can use the classic uh, uh, management versus worker analogy, our workers uh, are in a very privileged place. The lowest paid worker earns over a half a million dollars a year. The highest paid worker earns, and I have one of them, nearly $35 million a year. Uh, but these young men are represented by union. And uh, there are things that they think need to be better than they are. Uh, I think earning $35 million a year puts you in a sp pretty special place. But the collective bargaining process and the things that go on in that are a very, very challenging time. And, you know, thankfully we get... Uh, we don't have to do it every year. I don't think we would probably, many of us would still be owners if we had to do collective bargaining every year. Uh, but uh, once every five years, we, we put a lot of time, effort, and energy into planning those things that we think are important that we want to deal with the Players Association. I, and I don't have a, I, I don't want to come across as having a, uh, a, a bad feeling about the Players Association. As it happens, the head of the Players Association used to play for me, and he's a friend. Tony Clark, uh, a very fine uh, gentleman. Uh, uh, but collective bargaining is not fun. And in my whole business history and all the other things I've done, which are uh, pretty eclectic and across a very wide waterfront, it's the only area where I've, I've been involved in collective bargaining. And so w in this owner meeting, we're dealing with getting ready uh, for collective bargaining. And then we're dealing in the, la uh, 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 the meeting that just ended, we spent a good amount of time on instant replay. Uh, you know, one of those things that's advancing in all of sport to make the decisions made on the field as fair as they can be, uh, to give the umpires the support they need to certify what, they, what they're doing uh, is as accurate as it can be to create uh, fair play. So we're, we're dealing with that uh, issue, dealing with it also in uh, changing some of the rules to uh, limit injury. Uh, we went through a period uh, a couple of years ago where we changed the rule on sliding into home plate and because a very severe injury occurred with one of our star players. So we now have a, a different set of rules. Uh, we now are working on rules uh, covering sliding into second base because we had a very severe injury occur uh, last year uh, based on the way the rules are, are, are now written. Rules in college are way different, as you, a college player, would, uh, would know. Uh, you have to slide directly into the base in college. Uh, in in the, uh, professional baseball, that's not part of the deal. And so you can try to take out, if you will, the, the player. So not to get so nuanced as to go on forever, but we, we dealt with rules changes. We dealt with instant replay. We dealt with homeland security. We dealt with labor. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, I'm on, one of my roles is a part of the investment committee. And we have a pool of investments, so not unlike you would at a foundation. And we have an endowment fund and invest money on behalf of, of Major League Baseball. So we're dealing with the private equity people. Uh, we had a presentation uh, from the lead analyst at Goldman Sachs, uh, Abby Cohen, a name that some of you in business would know. And Abby is, is our advisor. And so she, uh, she came and uh, spoke to us uh, uh, one morning this week, and while we were in the meeting, and she was explaining that things weren't as bad as some thought they were, the stock market went down 500 points <laughs> during her presentation. <laughs> Obviously, we, 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 we weren't in charge <laughs> at that moment <laughs> as stewards of investments. But so I, I bring a, you know, I, I tell you all these things because it's a very wide waterfront of things uh, that we do in the meetings. And then offline, uh, we, uh, you know, as you, you develop friendships and relationships uh, at, the, at the dinners, uh, at the uh, hotel lounge, et cetera, then more stories are, sh are shared, and, and those are fun. And uh, it's a part of the joy of being involved in this. And I'll give you one, to, uh, one war story that, that uh, is apropos to, to us. We had a late night 
encounter with our counterparts from the San Francisco Giants. So it was Tony La Russa, a name that you would probably know, a Hall of Famer, who is my chief baseball officer, our team president, and me, with the, uh, our counterparts from the San Francisco Giants. And we had been very heavily in a competition uh, through the winter for a, uh, a star uh, player, Zach Greinke, who is one of the great pitchers in baseball. And he had become a free agent. And uh, we were cautious about whether we should bid for his services. Our economics are not as, as, as significant as the Giants and as the Dodgers, who were the other two teams who were competing for him. But they're in our division. And, and we knew that if he would become a Diamondbacks, a Diamondback, you know, we would improve our team and we would hurt our competition at the same time. And we knew that the Dodgers and the Giants were down to the very, very last vestiges of a negotiation involving a couple hundred million dollars. And we came up with what turned out to be a very uh, uh, timely and creative approach to putting a bid in. And within a very short period of time, the player and his agent agreed for him to become a Diamondback. So I knew that it all occurred. What I didn't know is what had gone on on the other side. And what I learned, and it, it's, I don't think, out of school to tell you, the Giants in the previous evening to the next day where we made our deal with the player were on a $200 million transaction within $5 million of signing the player the previous night. And both sides decided they would go home and think about it. And we entered the picture the next morning and got the player. So we learned that from our competitor. And you know, those are the kinds of, wow, I can't believe this happened, but it did. So those are the kinds of things that happen at owners' meetings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Does it get, I imagine it gets pretty competitive between you guys. Uh, just well, the, 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 the nature of all sports is you are a partner with all your peers because much of what you do, you have common interest. You share best practices, advancing the revenues of the game and creating uh, uh, more fans for the game is something we all share and, and we work together on. And then on the field, we're arch enemies. So you have that very dual kind of relationship with a guy that's a love-hate. You know, you hate the owner of the other team when they beat you, but you're good fr friends with him when you're in other settings. So that's, it's this unique to sports. And it's fun. Absolutely. So in the Institute for Leadership Advancement, uh, we focus a lot on values-based leadership. Can you tell us about one of your values and how you lead from it? <laughs> well, I, I, I think... If I had to give one value, and, and I think uh, more than one applies uh, to being in business and being a leader, uh, I, I think everything you do in business ought to be built around integrity. And, and you know, of course, that's a, a word that's not absolute in its definition. It's relative. Uh, but I think you all, all of us develop along our lives uh, a sense of right and wrong. And I think in, in being a leader, you want to you wanna think very hard and long about uh, what is right, and when you decide what is right, then pursue it, and be steadfast in, in pursuing it. And, and I would add then, you know, to uh, integrity-based leadership, I think another element that goes along with, with being a good leader is perseverance. And I think in leading, no matter what it has been that I've been involved in, uh, I've had moments, uh, there have been some occasions when this didn't happen, but in, in many different, I've been a, uh, someone described me once, and uh, it has a sort of a negative tone, but I took it as a compliment. I've been referred to as a serial entrepreneur, and, and meaning I have done a lot of different things in a lot of different settings across a wide waterfront. And I enjoy uh, being an entrepreneur, and... and uh, what I've had happen to me in many instances, and the Diamondbacks are no exception, is uh, early challenges of, uh, of problems, of, of uh, decisions that have not gone the way you would have wanted to, uh, wanted them to go, some things I have inherited, but actually things I made decisions on that didn't work out so well. And I believe had I not been a persevering kind of guy, things would not have ultimately moved into a more positive place. So I would say 
if you apply integrity to what you do and you persevere in what you do, I think your chances of success are enhanced. Mm -hmm. And your team regularly points out the fact that the ownership of the Diamondbacks uh, doesn't take any profits out of the team. You continually reinvest it uh, back into the team, into the community, and into the fan experience. And that may seem counterintuitive to uh, most people. Uh, so can you help us understand uh, kind of the thought process behind that? Yeah, I'm happy to. The, the, well, first off, we have a charitable foundation, and so you know, we, we do a lot of work in the community through our charitable foundation, and, and most sports teams do that. But on, on the, on the non-charitable side, uh, we're not in this uh, in a uh, uh, altruistic sense. You know, we're in it as a, an investment to bring a return. And however, we have modeled the way that we operate our team, and it was somewhat driven when I uh, was, I guess, called into action to be the leader. Uh, earlier leadership had created some very, very difficult financial problems for the team, and uh, I drew the short straw in being asked to come to resolve those financial difficulties and to hopefully maintain the, the, the club as locally owned, and so I signed up for that. And so I built a model that I called the legacy investment model. And I went to others to help finance. And what the legacy investment model is, and it was just what I called it and what I came up with, I knew that we needed very substantial money to put this franchise on the right footing. And, and I was prepared uh, to put very substantial personal resources in but I wasn't in a place where I could put all of the money in, and so I needed community partners. And so I built a financial plan, I built a financial model, and I called it the legacy model. And, and what I, I had a, a like any uh, fundraiser, I noticed that Mr. Daniels there on the front row, one of your leading fundraisers, uh, I built a, 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 built a model for the fundraising that I was gonna need to do, and a business plan that was associated with it that, showed some return on investment opportunities. Uh, and I called it the legacy model. And the legacy model was I would go and meet, you know, with well-known well -known people in our community, people with substantial net worths, who I felt could afford to make a multi-million dollar investment, which is what I was asking each person to do. And I would usually do it over lunch and would have, uh, uh, have a, meet, a luncheon meeting and would say, now we're about to, you know, have this uh, great lunch. And before we do, I want you to understand, I know you know that I'm here uh, to talk to you about potentially becoming a partner, uh, becoming a, a partner in the Diamondbacks, but I want you to understand what it's all about, and it's about a legacy investment. And people would kind of look at me like, you know, well, what is that? And I said, well, I want you to know because before, before we have lunch, because if when I tell you what it is, you don't think it appeals to you, we'll just have a nice lunch and we won't spend our time talking about the investment, if it appeals to you, then we will talk about the investment. And I had a X number of people, once they were told, we just had a nice lunch. I had a number of other people, fortunately, who were interested and ultimately became partners. What a legacy investment is, look somebody in the eye and say, I want you to invest with me in my enterprise $5 million. And I want you to understand this will be money that you'll never see again in your lifetime. It's a legacy for your children. <laughs> it's a legacy for your grandchildren. I believe that we can make this asset worth substantially more than it is worth, but the team needs every one of these dollars. We need all of the money to go into the team and stay into the team. We have substantial debt. We have opportunity to be competitive, but we have to spend more money that we don't have. We're gonna need all of your money for as long as I can see. And I want you to understand as the guy who is running the team, so long as I'm running the team, I will never take a penny from this team. That was near 15 years ago. <laughs> Guess what? I, we haven't. I haven't. And the uh, franchise has prospered. Uh, what has happened, and, and it's not just because of our actions alone, but those of you who would follow this probably are aware, the value of sports franchises has increased, increased dramatically. So that what was an investment back 12 to 15 years ago today is worth many times, uh, and you could sell your investment, nobody is restricted to it, but we're just not, we don't pay out dividends, we don't pay out distributions, nobody who operates the team as an owner receives any salary. And that has a element of a community uh, steward uh, 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 
element, uh, an element of being a community asset steward, which is what you are in sports. You know, we do own the team, but it really is a community asset. And so it's paying deference to that. It's creating a model that allowed us to raise money and keep the money and use it to enhance the value of the product. So that's how we've operated. Now, that's not for everyone, and there are a number of clubs that operate differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's our model. That's great. Uh, something as college students kind of moving out of college and into our careers, um, something that is, may generally be a challenge is how do you handle failure? And, and how do you learn from that and move on from that? Um, have you experienced any failures or challenges? And, and how have you kind of overcome that? Well, if you've been an entrepreneur, and I advertise myself as that, you have to have had failure. Uh, or you haven't really done very much. And uh, you don't spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about your failures, but you spend a lot of time thinking about them and, 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 and uh, focusing on what went wrong and why it went wrong and what you could have done or should have done and trying in the next venture not to repeat it. Now, I tell some stories about, uh, uh, about the uh, failure often is not that you did something and it didn't work, it's a failure of judgment in missing an opportunity that you could have done that you didn't. And, and I'll tell, uh, tell a story on myself uh, in that category, uh, and this is some years back. My original business partner in the technology company, very bright guy, still a very close uh, friend from going back to when we became partners in 1970. So we've known each other 45 years, 46 years. And after we were uh, separated, uh, this goes back 20 years or so ago, separated from active duty and our software company, we turned the management over to other very bright managers. We still owned it. We still had oversight uh, to a point, but we each were living away from uh, headquarters, which was Northern Virginia. He was in California, I was in Arizona. You know, we were on the board, we were active in giving some counsel to our management team, but we were investing in individual things and we were investing in things together that were not in, in the primary company. And he called me up one day and he says, boy, have I got a deal for you. And I said, oh really? Because we had done some other deals where he says, well, he said, you probably, and I didn't, uh, you probably know about the craze that's going on uh, in, in the health food world. I said, no, no, not really. He says, well, he said, you ever heard of a company called Power Bar? I said, no, not really. He says, well, he says, you know, the, the, these energy bars are taking over. The young people are really into it, those who are active and work out. They're, uh, you know, there's some health value to these, uh, 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 these products. And he said, I have a formula that I have obtained the rights to for a, health, uh, for a health bar. And he said, I want to start a company and build a competitive product to, uh, to Power Bar. Well, you know, Tom, that's not too appealing to me. Said, we don't know that the formula is any good. And he said, oh, well, this scientist has developed it, and he's got it, uh, whatever, he, he owns the formula. Uh, I think it will be good. Uh, he said, um, you know, there's a real marketplace, Olympic athletes would, you know, they, you know, power bar is what it is, but there, there are markets that we could attack. I said, oh, wait a minute, let me see if I'm listening correctly. You want to take on a formula to build a candy bar, that's what I called it, uh, and you and I have never been in manufacturing, we've never been in distribution, we've never been in retail, We've never been in branding, and, you, and the investment was going to be, and, and you want to invest X in this. I, I, I think it's a fool's errand. I, I'm not doing it. Uh, the company was Balance Bar. <laughs> he started Balance Bar. If you followed the history, any of you, of that industry, it is uh, still probably the second most successful product ever. So is that a failure? Maybe in judgment on my part. Uh, maybe it's just good luck on his. I don't know. But, you know, as you go through life, you have opportunities that you miss. And, and that's okay. 
uh, because I can talk about other things that maybe seemed as bizarre as that uh, did to me that I did that worked. Uh, so uh, failure of opportunity more than failure of operation, if you will, is I guess what I would say. Okay. And uh, just to kind of tie things up here, can you speak briefly on where you see the sport of baseball going in the next five to ten years? Boy, at, I didn't talk about that topic when you asked about the owner meetings, but it, it's a fast-changing landscape, sports is. Um, we, in our sport, are working wor very, very hard to make our sport more appealing to uh, younger people. Uh, I think we're viewed as the sport that never ends. The games never end. The games are slow. Uh, there isn't the action moments that may be some of the other sports. So we're working very hard to make changes on speed of the game, if you will, those kinds of things, uh, to try to make the game move at a, at a more rapid clip. Uh, one of the very significant things that's going on in our sport and in all sports is video streaming. You know, we have built some models for delivering our games to your handheld devices in every way, shape, and form that you might want to watch the game wherever you may be, uh, whenever it may be. Uh, and, and I see a lot of evolution in the, in the uh, watching of games from, uh, you know, the phrases now, and these probably are well known to some of you, it's an area of language that I'm learning, and it's the, uh, the cable television world. Uh, there are now the cord cutters. There are the cord shavers. There are the, uh, 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 the cord nevers. You know, all of those things probably are familiar to all of you about how do I receive my video in life and what is it that I want to see, where and when do I see it. So we're trying to apply our game to keeping pace with the rapidly changing landscape that young people are presenting us and the advancing technology and trying to be able to do it in a way where we can monetize what it is that we do because we don't want to give our product away. Uh, we want to make it available to everybody that wants it, but we want them to pay us for uh, uh, watching the game. So a lot is moving uh, in, in that area. There are in the world, some, some of you may know this, I, I'm only recently aware, there are a total of five billion handheld devices in the world. The challenge is, how do you get your product on as many of those as you can and have as many people watching your sport as you can possibly reach? That's one of the challenges that is evolving over the landscape of all sports and ours in particular. Great. At this point, I'd like to just open the floor for questions from the audience right in front here. Morning, Mr. Kendrick. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm William Kirk, third year marketing major, Leonard Scholar. Um, my first question is as a, as, actually as a baseball fan. Um, many of us are baseball hands in here, and I'm sure that we all understand the value of the Honus Wagner card that you have. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could just talk about how much it means to you and kind of your experience with that and why you decided to buy it. Good question. Well, I, I have been, a lot, as I said earlier, a lifelong lover of the game. I, like probably some of you in the audience, collected baseball cards as a young boy. Um, uh, you know, there's a window when that occurs, and then uh, maybe more real life uh, intervenes when you become a teenager. You discover that there are females in the world, and that changes your, persp <laughs> changes your perspective. And, and anyway, baseball cards become less important. But fortunately, I'm one of those who had a mom who kept my childhood baseball card collection. And in later years, uh, she reminded me she still had them. And I was now, at that point, already involved in baseball actively. And, and so I put all my cards together from childhood and had some wonderful cards because I was a little boy in the 50s. And some of the greatest players of you know, baseball's history uh, started in that time, the Mickey Mantles and the Hank Aarons and the Jackie Robinsons and the Ernie Banks and you know, lots of great baseball players. I had their cards. Now. That inspired me a little bit because, boy, these are worth quite a bit of money. But in the baseball card world, there, it's like in all worlds of collectibles, there are levels. And so there are elite cards that, that uh, uh, I did not have. 
And I, by being involved in the game, I began to have connections with people who had very substantial uh, collectibles and was fortunate in being able to negotiate to acquire some very elite uh, baseball cards. I don't have a large number, but I have a, a very high quality collection. And in the history of that sport, of the collection world, the Honus Wagner card, Honus Wagner was one of the original all-star players. Honus Wagner was from the early 1900s. Honus Wagner's cards are scarce because Honus Wagner was anti-tobacco. And when the cards were printed back over 100 years ago, they were on the back, uh, the, they were advertising, advertisements for cigarettes. And Wagner's image was printed and he became unhappy and they removed his cards you know, from, uh, from the, the uh, market. And so relatively few of his cards were out and age and rarity and notoriety all drive value. And the Wagner card became over time the, uh, uh, it's had very, it's called the card, actually books written about it the Mona Lisa of baseball cards, et cetera. And uh, in any event, uh, I, I uh, connected with the third party who knew the person who owned it. It had been previously owned to me buying it in uh, 2008. It had been owned by Wayne Gretzky uh, and the late actor John Candy uh, were the owners of the card. And they sold it. Uh, it was put in an auction by Walmart and some lady got it. I think she was from Georgia. <laughs> and of course, she didn't want it. She sold it. And so its value moved up. And in 2008, a, a fellow in California owned it. And uh, I made a bid and was able to acquire it. So I, uh, uh, I'm very proud to have it uh, because it is, it is the most elite among, uh, you know, among the precious baseball cards. I think we have time for one more question. working with them in, in the sense that uh, when we get together in meetings and what do we do? You know, well, baseball is structured like most, uh, uh, many other uh, endeavors. Uh, we have committees uh, of owners that are focused on different areas. Uh, we have a investment committee, which I alluded to earlier, that I'm a part of. Um, and several of the owners are professionals in the investment world. We have outside uh, people that, uh, uh, that advise us, like I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, a diversity committee, which I've been an active part of. Diversity is a very important element in sports. Uh, we try very hard and continue to build our relationships with the minority communities to make them be an active and integral part of our sports. Uh, we have an international committee because we have a lot of international players, and so uh, we have a, a, a a media committee, to, uh, uh, an online, uh, we call it baseball advanced media, that's our online offering. Some of you will, MLB.com uh, is, is one of its manifestations, the team websites and all that. It's a committee that I sit on. And so you have professionals that are the baseball uh, front office people that are the operational folks and the boards of these various areas are made up of five owners in this one, seven owners in this one. So you know, we, we act as boards of directors to the specific areas and, you know, give our counsel uh, to each of the distinct areas where we do committee work. Great. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mr. Kendrick. Thank you. Thank you, guys. On behalf of the Institute for Leadership Advancement and the Terry Leadership Speaker Series, we would like to thank Mr. Kendrick for coming today. <laughs> Students, please fill out the Who Are You cards that, are, that you received as you walked in. Our next Terry Leadership Speaker Series will be March 18th with Debbie Story from AT&T. Thanks again for coming.